Hello, and welcome to Christ Community Church Online. My name is Jenna, and I'm so glad that you could tune in with us today. We would love to connect with you, so we invite you to go to the link in the description and fill out our Connect card online. Our vision here at Christ Community Church is to encounter, pursue, and live like Jesus. Our prayer for you today is that no matter what day of the week it is, or where you're watching this message from, that you truly encounter Him. So let's get started. Amen. Go ahead and find a seat where you are this morning. Thank you, worship team. Thanks for letting me interrupt you guys this morning. They were prepared with more songs, but, you know, just blame Michelle for bringing that word and, and just really uh, that, that word. There was, there's something on that word for you guys this morning, and it's not just about Michelle's childhood and a picture from, from her childhood. It's about what God wants to communicate in the room this morning. He will not reject your longing for him, your hands raised to him. He will not say, sorry, I'm too busy. He will not say, sorry, you're not ready. He can't. He can't. You know why? He can't refuse his own son. And his own son and his son's blood applied to your life means there's nothing about you that is not fully satisfying to him. These are not my words. These are the word of God this morning, and, and I'm really excited uh, to share more from this word. Um, by the way, good morning. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm the, the senior pastor here at Christ Community Church. If you're new with us this morning, we are so excited you're here. Um, if you haven't been here for a little while and you're back, welcome back. Um, if you were here last Sunday, hey, I don't know. I, I, hi. I'm, I'm glad you're all here. Whatever the reason is, whatever the frequency is, um, but if you're new, I want to invite you to fill out the Connect card that's on the back of one of the seats near in front of you. And if you fill that out, just put your name and contact information on there and throw that in the tithes and offerings box. It just helps us learn more about you, your name. You matter. And it's so great that you're here. A um, couple quick things before I dive into preaching the word. First off, yes, I am going to draw this morning. Get ready. I don't, I don't know if there's one person applauding. No, uh, I don't want you to be distracted. I just want you to know this, this is connected to the sermon today. So just, you can just forget about this until I draw attention to it. A um, couple other things. Uh, be praying for our leadership team because actually a few of us are already on our way to Michigan. Uh, several of us will be on our way right after this service today. Um, going to the Radiant Network uh, Leadership Conference called Arise Shine out in Kalamazoo. Michigan. And so I just want to invite you to pray a blessing over the leadership of your church family. Um, that's a good thing to do, uh, to pray that we receive everything God wants to give us this week, that it would be a refreshing time, but also a really fun and equipping time. And, um, and that out there among our, our church family that we're connected to at the Radiant Network, we would have a wonderful time. Um, I'm really, really, really uh, pumped about something going on next week. Next week is Mother's Day. Yes. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but without mom, you wouldn't be here. And, uh, and that, that really counts for a lot more, a lot of ways. There's a lot of dynamics involved in that, but um, we're going to do something kind of special, and actually, you can get involved in it today before you leave uh, the building. Somebody say, today. I can do this today. You don't have to wait. Uh, right out in the cafe, actually, near the coffee table, in the corner, you see a special little kind of setup there. There are um, supplies there for you to write a special um, note or special message to a mother that you love. And so we want to encourage you to get on that early. If you do it today, then, then you won't forget between now and next Sunday. And you can either hand that to them, take that with you today, and hand that to them in person. Um, also inviting you to fill out a special uh, message for a special mom here that you want to give a, a message to, a shout out to, or just all moms here. And you can actually post it right there to the boards, I believe. Uh, a special, fun, and creative way that you can say thank you to all the moms in your life. And so you can get involved in that today. Um, we are in a, a somewhat new sermon series uh, called A New Way to Be Human. And what we've been looking at in this series is the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus in Matthew 5 through 7 where Jesus stood up, actually sat down uh, at the beginning of Matthew 5, but he had a crowd around him and he was just 
in just the right geographical environment where he could speak firmly and be heard a long ways, very clearly. And he sat and he taught. He sat and he instructed. He sat and he shared from, listen to me, you need to catch the significance of this. Because John 1 says, he is the word of God. From the beginning, he was here Everything is made by him and for him and through him and all of that. And the word of God himself sat down and shared from himself. How many of you know when Jesus broke bread with the disciples and took communion, like we're going to a little bit later. You can just hold on to these for a little bit. We're going to do that in the service today before we end our time. But when Jesus broke bread and handed it to them, he wasn't just saying, here's something that I'm giving you. He was saying, here's me. And when Jesus sat for the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't just say, here's some information. He was saying, here's me. Here's God. Here's what you need. Uh, It's not just rules and information. It's an invitation, actually, to let who God is in the person of Jesus and what flowed in his life flow in your life as well so that you're not just walking around trying to fake it till you make it, but you're actually living like God. Jesus is part of our vision here at Christ Community Church for you, is that what was in the Son of God would would get into you. Scripture says he sent the Spirit of his Son into your heart to cry out, Abba, Father. And we've been crying out to the Father this morning. And um, I don't know if you pay attention to any of this or if you're, you know, an expert in communication like our own Alex Lyon or, or others in the church, but Um, I have a little bit of a format I I try to follow and try to be consistent with. I like to start with a story or a a funny thing to kind of engage you and kind of get you going. I don't have a story today. Um, Then I I try to play on like some tension of like what's happening in culture or how this, you know, what the pain point of your life might be. I don't have any of that today. I just want to dive right into the Word of God. Is that good? Today my message is called Christ Fulfills the Law, and I want to read together out of Matthew Chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. I would love to hear some paper Bibles turning right now um, because your phone is just too much of a temptation to check like the weather or something. Um, But either way, open whatever Bible you have to Matthew chapter 5 and let's read these words together. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 17. You ready? Is anybody going to talk to me in church today? (laughs) It's so much more fun when you guys talk back, okay? So much more fun. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 17, Jesus has already begun. He's kind of in the midst of his sermon here. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. Come on, would you pray with me one more time that the Holy Spirit would come lead and guide us to all truth? We need that this morning. Holy Spirit, come do exactly what Jesus said you would do in our lives. Lead us to truth. We're not talking about somebody's truth out there. We're not talking about the government's truth. We're not talking about Hollywood's truth. We're talking about the truth of God that has stood for all of time. Would you come reveal Jesus, the Son of God, here in our midst and everything he has for us in this sermon. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Um. This is going to be really fun today, but I'm telling you in advance, it's a lot. And you might look and think, man, why are we taking these little chunks of this sermon? Like, couldn't we take a big, we're going to bite a bigger chunk next week, I promise. But there is so much going on here in four verses. So much important stuff. We've really got to take our time with it today. And I want to try to break this down because uh, last week I described the Word of God, and in particular this sermon, is not just information on a page. It's a spiritual meal. I said it's a spiritual meal, somebody. And, and that means that we get to take this in today and digest it in our spirit. And, and 
you know, for you to be filled with the word of God means that you're able to be filled with what filled the life of Jesus. Did you know that in Matthew 4, Jesus was led out into a temptation that I cannot imagine bearing 40 days without eating anything. It would be especially hard for me, anybody like, like me this morning, as some of you are indifferent to food, I guess, but I need food. And if you ate breakfast this morning because you knew you'd get a little hangry but by the end of church, you know what I'm talking about. But in Matthew 4, the tempter, Satan, approaches him and says, if you are the Son of God, questioning his identity, if you are who you say you are, if you are who you think you are, then turn these stones into bread. That would have been awesome. I would love to see some stones turned into some fresh baked bread, okay? Jesus, however, answered, being full of the Spirit of God and full of the wisdom of God and the Word of God himself, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Which means this word is like bread for your inner man or inner woman, okay? (laughs) I'm sorry, I just don't don't want you to be offended by little things this morning. Jesus was fed and filled with the word of God, and you can be too. Come on. That's good. That's really good. So let's break this into four parts like a four-course meal. Let's think about it that way. I don't know. I don't don't have the means to eat four-course meals all the time. Um, But appetizer, salad or soup, main course, dessert, let's get into it. The first course for us this morning I want you to see is that Jesus completes the story of Scripture. Jesus said, don't think, it would be wrong to think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. This is kind of a thinking he wanted to to head off early because he's come to build a new covenant. In fact, when Jesus shared the first communion meal with his disciples, um, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. But he wanted to make sure to be very clear here early in his ministry, I've not come to abolish what has been written. Now, in Jesus' day, this would have been the Old Testament or the Torah, the Bible of their day. Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Everything, every word of God written down so far. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, it would be, it's important for us to sort out and really get this correct, because it would be um, true But maybe not the whole picture if all this communicated to you this morning was that Jesus fulfills the requirements of God, right? Because if we look at the law and we look at the prophets, it's a lot of instruction, it's a lot of teaching, it's a lot of, of talking to the Israelites and saying, do this, don't do that, act like this, right? Don't lie, don't kill, don't do these things, right? Um, And if all you get out of Jesus' words here is, well, Jesus did the things God said to do and didn't do the things God said not to do. Yes, that would be true, but it's not really the whole picture, is it? I think it would be better to see what Jesus is saying here as as essentially Jesus saying, I am the focus and reason for all the scriptures, right? Because Jesus is going to say to the scribes later on in the gospels, you search them, you memorize them, you devote your life to the scriptures because you think they give you life, but they point to me, Jesus said. Okay? You're tracking so far. So a much better way to say this in my own words today is Jesus is the focus of and reason for the scriptures. The beginning and the end. The alpha and omega. The fulfillment of the entire biblical narrative. What is the entire biblical? It's a lot of pages. It's a lot of chapters. It's a lot of spanning, you know, a lot of time. Here's, again, in my own words, a simplified, boiled-down version of the biblical narrative that Jesus totally fulfills and completes. That mankind was created by a loving God for relationship with him. I did okay. All right. All right. I got some amens on that one. Mankind now, now listen, there are a lot, there's a lot off of this. Volumes and volumes and libraries of books could be written to, to really lay all of this out according to Scripture, right? Mankind, well, what about the rest of creation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but God basically made a point to say, this is the pinnacle of all that I've made so far. He said, let's not just make stuff now. Let's make people. And let's make them after our image. And we'll get to that uh, a little bit more in just a second. That mankind was created, which means on purpose, not by mistake or accident, 
by a loving God. It could be, you could describe this by, in a lot of different ways. I'm making a point today to say by a loving God, by a heavenly father, by one who is seen through the parallel, through the illustration of family. When a father is present and loving and gracious and supplies what is needed and doesn't lie to his kids, cheat them, leave them, abandon them, we see a, a reflection of how God is towards us. By loving God, and we were made for something, for a relationship with him, and that relationship turns into ministry and mission and all of those wonderful things, yes. But simplified down, this is the narrative that Jesus fulfills and completes. Let's look at it together. Jesus actually is seen scripturally as our creator. Colossians 1.16 says, Everything was made by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. First, or sorry, John 1, not 1 John 1. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It's a, a little dizzying uh, grammar there. But um, what is the scripture saying? Well, Again, to make sure you get it right, Jesus was not a created being who didn't exist and then did exist. Jesus always was. It just so happened that he kind of put on your pants and squeezed into human history in a visible form about 2,000 years ago so that he could reveal who God was to us. In fact, let me make sure to clarify Jesus is the image we are made from. We talked about this in week one. Genesis 1.26, God speaking the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, speaking to himself, let us, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Colossians 1.15 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Therefore, two and two, put it together. Jesus is the image who always was that we were made after. This is important because I think sometimes we get a little mixed up and we think, Jesus put on our image. Think about that. That God was just like, I don't know, this like nebulous, glowing, floating something in space and then had to kind of make a, you know, a cookie cut out of, of what a human would look like and it turned into us. And, and then in order to come like us, he had to he had to put on that form, but actually, Scripture says we put on his form. We were made in his image. Actually, Jesus has a glorified body just like this in heaven right now, with scars in his hands and in his side and in his feet. Interesting. And what's better is even though sin causes us to malfunction in this likeness-bearing call on our lives to, to bear the image of God, Romans 8, 29 says the Father's work and the Holy Spirit's work in your life is for you to know you were, you were known ahead of time and predestined to be made back into that image you were created from. To be conformed, Scripture says in Romans 8, 29, to the image of His Son. Man, Michelle, I'm so glad that you shared what you shared this morning. I didn't realize how much of this overlaps with what I was planning to preach. Check this out. Jesus is the proof of God's love. I totally forgot that I had this point in here when we went into all that business uh, after worship. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love that he, Christ, laid his life down for you. John 17, 23, this is Jesus praying to his heavenly father. And this is what he had to say. Father, so that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them even as you love me. Jesus is the proof of God's love for you. This is the prayer of Jesus, the high priestly prayer in John 17. Jesus reveals the Father. Listen, it would, be, it would be good and fine, actually, if Jesus just wanted to come accomplish his own will. I mean, I think we could still trust that. But Jesus made a point to say, I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm here to do what the Father wants me to do. Which is good news for you. It means that the heavenly Father in heaven is not, you know, this angry God who, who, who wants to send thunder and lightning bolts on your butt. Um, but Jesus is like, no, no, God, don't. No, no, Jesus is here saying, I'm here because the Father said, go and rescue them. John 14, 6, I, oh, sorry, John 14, 9. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. 
And in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's about to be betrayed into the hands of the mob who are going to take him and beat him and accuse him and all of these things, he's praying to the Father, he's crying out, and he's saying, not my will, not my comfort, not what's easy, but what you've sent me to do. And on the cross, before he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. What is finished? The work that you sent me to do, Father, is finished, completed. The task is done. Jesus redeemed us for a reason now to make relationship possible. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which means Jesus wants you to come to the Father. (laughs) And he wants you to come through believing that he is who the scriptures say that he is. We could go on and on and on like this, but Jesus is the complete biblical narrative this morning. You can open up your Old Testament. You can open up the law of Moses. You can open up the prophets and see Jesus. And Jesus stands here in the Sermon on the Mount and says, I've not come to abolish or put that away. And we'll break that out a little bit more here in a second. I've come to complete it and fulfill it. So let's get back to our verse now. This is just verse 1, verse 17 technically, but our first verse today. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. Key words here for us to understand what exactly Jesus is saying. Abolish. Let's look at this first. I've not come to abolish, which means to overthrow or destroy or invade. Check this out unyoke or unharness. That's really good. That's really, really good. What Jesus is saying is, I've not come to disconnect your life from the Old Testament. I've not come to unyoke or unharness you from the Word of God, which is great considering Matthew 11, and we looked at this a couple weeks ago, that Jesus is going to give this invitation in a few chapters. Come to me, all of you who are weary, trying to live this life in your own strength. You're burdened, I want to give you rest, he says, and this is how I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Nearly all biblical scholars unanimously would call the yoke of Jesus the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, take my sermon on your life. Take this equipment I'm giving you. Take this on your heart. Take what's in me. Put it in, you know, get it in you on the inside. Get the word of God in you. Learn from me, he says, because I'm lowly and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You're like, Pastor, I've read this word before. It ain't easy. (laughs) It ain't easy. Well, Frederick Dale Bruner, in his commentary on Matthew, he said what Jesus means is that obedience to his Sermon on the Mount or his yoke will develop in us balance and a way of carrying life that will give more rest than the way that we've been living. It's about trust. It's about trusting what Jesus came to do is not unharness you from the Word of God, but harness you even further. (laughs) Fully harness you. In fact, he says, I haven't come to abolish. I've come to fulfill, which means to make full, complete, perfect, perform, execute. Or, Or one biblical scholar I read, I like this. He came to fill it full. I like that. I like that. It means not a drop is missing from what God wants you to be connected to in his word. So again, Jesus is saying, I've not come to unyoke you or unharness you from the Old Testament or from the word of God. I am the Old Testament. I am the law. I am the prophets. I am the word of God. No, I don't want you to Start, I don't want you to get, get it wrong here that, that I've come to close the book and start a new book. No, this is the same book, the same God and the same story. And Jesus fulfills it. Let me give you one more really good quote before we move on to course two from Michael Miller here. I, I gave you the, just the first line. Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. <laughs> this is from Michael's book, His House, His Presence. The staff and elders and I are going to get to hear Michael Miller preach this week at Arise Shine. I'm really looking forward to that. In this book, he says, Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. All right, I'm going to read a little lengthy section. Stay with me. Are you with me? God, who for centuries has been interpreted through lesser revelations, has chosen to define himself through one person, Jesus Christ. The basis of our faith 
as Christians is that Christ is the highest revelation of God. My thoughts about God have to be found in the person of Jesus. Jesus ends all questions surrounding the mystery of who God is. The word of God took on flesh, became a man. Any idea or thought that you have about God must be found in the life and revelation of Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of God to us today. And if we want to know God, we must get to know Jesus. Somebody say, encounter Jesus, pursue Jesus, live like Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Add whatever you want as long as it's Jesus. Okay. Course number two. We're moving on to super salad. You pick. Um, God's expectations simplified. And I, I, I'm really excited about this because I, I hope this is going to help you grasp and get excited about the Word of God because I think that sometimes some of you get turned off by this book because it's just so big and complicated and hard to understand. And, and it's like, you know what? I'll just live in like John and Acts. And I'll read that over and over and over again. I'll just read Paul's epistles and, and, and just take it for what it is. The whole Word of God is good for you, the believer. The whole word of God, Jesus said, I've not come to abolish it. I've not come for you to set some of it. We're going to get into the later verses here in just a second. I've not come so that you can treat, uh, you know, the lesser parts or or the higher parts and and treat it with distinction. It's all the word of God. It's all good for us. But let's see if we can't maybe simplify it a little bit this morning. We know that when Jesus says the law or the prophets, he's referring to the Bible of his day which consisted of the Old Testament to us, the Torah is what they would have called it in the Jewish community, which consisted of the Pentateuch, four books of the Bible. I'm revisiting my Bible school days. Heavy right now, okay? I have not said Pentateuch in about 18 years, okay? The Pentateuch, which are the four books of Moses, the historical books of Israel's history, the wisdom or poetic books, which would be Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and the prophetic books, which consist of major and minor prophets. I did pay attention in Bible school. <laughs> Obviously, we don't have time to go through this entire thing, okay? Um, but I think we can see everything by seeing one thing. We good? Let's see everything by seeing one thing. And I want to reveal my drawings this morning. Do they make sense to you right off the bat? Hopefully not. Let me, let me try to explain some stuff here. I'll, I'll move my, my thing here. Let's try to see everything by seeing one thing. Now, if you walk outside um, in my yard and here at the church, we've got some big, wonderful, beautiful trees here. Big, I mean, I've got some trees in my backyard I cannot wrap my, my arms around. Okay? Anybody got a tree like that in their yard or, or know of, of one? Now, this tree cannot get to this size until it's first been like a sapling, my little Charlie Brown tree here, okay? I drew this all ahead of time, so I wouldn't make, you know, any critical mistakes. I'm terrified to do this stuff in front of people, honestly, (laughs) or misspell something, okay? This big, great, mammoth, gigantic tree that a, a, a hurricane could not bring down because the roots are so deep and it's so strong, first has to be like this. But they're the same tree, they have the same DNA. Not only that, but, you know, let's say this is a, an oak tree, right? comes from acorns. Am I getting this right? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm terrified to say something really dumb in front of all of you guys. But here's what I want you to see. This is this is this. Agree? The DNA of this is the DNA of this is the DNA of this. And this cannot become this without being this. With me so far? I feel like, inconceivable. You know, ever heard of Socrates, Aristotle? Morons. <laughs> okay, now let me have fun with you because uh, we've been uh, doing some math at home. Mason's here. We've been working on uh, some different things at home. Um, hi, Mace. And, and with the boys, we, we try our best to do homework. Listen, homework is different today. Homework is different. Um, Yeah, okay. So let's take a a complex fraction here. Now, don't get your phone out and do math. Just trust me, okay? 
171, now if I, you know, if I hid these things, 171 over 228 would take you a little while to figure out how to reduce that down, right? But you can trust me, I've done this ahead of time, that this can be broken down to this, can be broken down to this. Which means this and this have the same value. Mm hmm mm hmm Same DNA, same value. Good? Now, all the law and the prophets, that's a lot. That's the entire Old Testament. That's all of the books, you know, the sections, the categories of, of the Word of God up till Jesus' day. He's saying all the law. I've not come to abolish. I've come to fulfill all the law and the prophets. Okay? All the law and the prophets carry the same DNA, same value as the 613 laws found in the book or found in the, the law of Moses. 613 is a, a measurable finite number that's a little easier to digest than all. All's like, well, what do you mean by that? That's a lot. That's a whole Bible. You could boil it down and say, well, well, there's nothing about all the law and the prophets that would contradict the 613 laws of God. Agreed? Okay? And actually, there's nothing in the Ten Commandments that would contradict or be different from all the law and the prophets in the 613 laws. It's all kind of just like there are Ten Commandments, and then they get broken up into greater detail here, right? Agree with that so far? Actually, you know what? We could reduce this even further because Jesus told us in Matthew 22, there's really the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Heart, soul, mind, whichever order. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says what? And all the law and prophets hang on this, which means this is this is this is this. Same DNA, same value. Same DNA and value. Can we reduce it any further than that? Yes, Jesus. <laughs> Hi, Jesus. You, you are the word of God. You are all the law and the prophets. You are the perfect fulfillment to the greatest commandments. You are the perfect fulfillment to the Ten Commandments. It's okay to give an amen with every one of these. You are the perfect fulfillment of all the 613 laws in the book of Moses, of the laws of Moses. You are the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. Okay. Is that helpful to anybody this morning to just break it down that way? Um, because I can't eat a whole cow, but I could eat a steak right now. Come on. And if you cut that bad boy up over a couple of weeks, my cholesterol will be insane, but I will eat that cow, okay? This is the word of Jesus. I'm here to fulfill all the law and the prophets, which is the same as all the 613 commands, the 10 commandments, the two greatest commandments. I am here. Now, a right response at this point might be, oh God, you are terrifyingly complex and yet unsettlingly simple. Because God, at least if you were so complex, you were out of reach and far away and I wasn't even in the same zip code, then I would have an excuse to not follow these things. But because you come in one human life, and even break it down into two great commandments. I have no excuse. Because, Jesus, you've come to do the work of fulfilling it all, so I don't even have to feel that pressure. Oh, God, this is terrifying. It's so complex and so simple all at the same time, and it's that kind of spiritual poverty. I can't even begin to, to solve this riddle to, to solve this Rubik's Cube, God, that's so simple and in my hands, but so amazingly complex as all the law and the prophets that I can hold an acorn in my hand, but I don't understand really what's going on all the time under the surface with this tree and under the surface of the soil. There's so much to your word. There's so much to following this yoke. This, this Sermon on the Mount is so much, and yet so simple and so, so right here and attainable. 
And it's this kind of spiritual poverty that Jesus talked about when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand without God, I can't. Blessed are those who understand without God, I could never. And that actually Jesus coming to fulfill all the law and the prophets is the best news in the world. Which brings me to our third course and my third point here, that all of this is impossible without God. And you were never meant to try and run and chase and lift and, and do the heavy work on your own, by yourself. It was always going to be about Jesus, the Son of God, coming to fulfill this and then filling your life with what filled his life. Matthew 5, back to our section of Scripture this morning. Let's read the rest of it here. Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom. And I would propose to you that the Jewish people hearing Jesus say this were terrified. Because they knew how hard the scribes and Pharisees were working to memorize whole books of the Bible, dedicating their lives from childhood to the performance of God's laws and expectations, and in fact, adding to the 613 their own traditions from their forefathers and all of that. Three very important things Jesus says here. Not an iota or dot will pass or be missed. Remember, God gave us the law. He doesn't need it. It was for us. Paul calls it, calls it our, our guardian or our tutor that was, that was instructing us on the things of God, the, instructing humanity on the things of God until Christ could come and totally set us free. And he's watching us, and he's saying, I want you to know that I'm not relaxing one. I'm not, you got to cross every T and dot every I. I'm not relaxing one aspect of that. Um, the iota is the Hebrew yod, which was the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the dot likely refers to just any tiny stroke that's part of a Hebrew letter. Jesus is saying, I won't relax any of it. And whoever does relax it is going to be brought down to the least in my kingdom because you're out of alignment with my word and who I am. And then he says this, and unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, what? These guys are like superheroes. They memorize books of the Bible. They were raised around the traditions of the Jewish faith. They're militant. I'm toast. How is my righteousness ever going to exceed? we got to flip the script a little bit, which I think is what Jesus is doing here. Um, Oswald Chambers, our boy, he's got our back. He said, our Lord's principles are unbelievably difficult. Let's check this out on the screens. Everything he teaches is impossible unless he can put into us his spirit and remake us from within. Now, let me remind you this morning, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the prophet Samuel went to anoint the next king of Israel. And he went and he saw all these tall, handsome guys at Jesse's house. And he said, surely it must be one of these. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not... As man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I would have you understand these words are incredibly prophetic, incredibly meaningful. Because in the Gospels, Jesus is going to go after the Pharisees and scribes as what? Whitewashed tombs. You're painted right on the outside, but on the inside, it's just dead bones. Now, he says, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. But when we consider the fact that there's really no righteousness there at all, you take a deep breath, okay, this morning. Whew, okay, that's good news so far. Let's go back to, to David's story, though, because God goes on to say, I've found someone whose heart is after my heart. His name is David. He anoints him king. Let's do a comparison here now between Saul and David, because Saul was tall, handsome, strong. He was the first king in Israel's history. Tall, handsome, strong, outwardly appealing, but disobedient, insecure, compromising, manipulative. David, small, young, 
ruddy. I think that means he had red hair, right? Unexpected, surrendered, tender, repentant, a man after God's heart. Which one sounds like what God is looking for? Is God looking for the, the militant, you know, never miss a, miss a single aspect, but on the inside it's just all dead? Or is he looking for a heart after his heart, right? Now let's overlay that on, on Jesus' words to the scribes and Pharisees. That they were respected and honored by the people for their outward performance. In fact, they become kind of the example Jesus uses of how not to do it. So in order for Jesus to say, your righteousness needs to exceed theirs, he's saying, don't be like them. Okay? They were rejected by God for their inward evil, just like Saul. Scripture tells us they planned to kill Jesus. And if I asked you this morning, I'm not going to take a poll, but what do you think the main reason, some of you know the answer because you, you've read it, what do you think the main reason is that the Pharisees decided to kill Jesus according to Scripture? Anybody know? Somebody said envy? Mark 15.10, he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Huh, interesting. Interesting. Jesus was God's son, and therefore, out of relationship of what God provided for him, more righteous than they could ever be in their own effort. His righteousness exceeded theirs. Guess what Jesus offers you when you profess faith that he's the son of God, his own righteousness? Romans 3 says, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law or apart from performance. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. Not all who perform, not all who are militant, not all who are disciplined to the point of perfection like the Pharisees and scribes were trying to be. All who believe. There is no distinction, Paul says in Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Jesus speaks with true authority. We know that because in week one, we looked all the way at the end of Matthew 7. It says they were amazed that he taught with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees who taught from the standpoint of, you better, these words are in this book, and it was just information to them, but Jesus is teaching as if he is the word. He shows that he's, not only supportive of God's high demands for holiness, but Jesus actually raises the bar. And we're going to start that whole journey next week when Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say, right? But we're coming in here on the foundation that that would all be impossible without what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. It would be understandable for anyone to feel overwhelmed by such a demanding section of Scripture. But as we've seen, it's impossible without God. He doesn't want you to try harder. He wants you to find a new way to be human. A new way that is trusting in him and his finished work. A new way that doesn't rely on what you can do today in your performance, but what he has already done once and for all in his performance. Romans 8 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is the word of God saying the righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled in you, but not in you, just you, in you when Christ is in you who walk according, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Um, that's all a really uh, beautiful section there. Whoa, oops. Bear with me one second. I've got to kind of skip ahead a little bit here. Yeah. 
Um, Mary, would you come, please, and play a little bit over here by my beautiful illustrations? I want you to grab the uh, cup and, and juice and, and just keep it close by. Oswald Chambers says, can God make me pure in heart? Blessed be his name, he can. Can he alter my disposition so that when circumstances reveal me to myself, I am amazed? He can. Can he impart his nature to me until it is identically the same as his own? He can. That and nothing less is the meaning of his cross and resurrection. Jesus communicated all that his life and his teaching and his death and resurrection would accomplish when he shared an important meal with his disciples towards the end of your Gospels. And here's what I, I want you to see this morning. You're invited to the table of God. And it's not by your own ability to, to accomplish any of this. It's based on what Jesus has already done, and that's what these elements represent today. We're going to take these elements and, and do it uh, uniquely here at the end of our service. And when we receive them, we're going to pray. The altar prayer team will be here today. If anyone needs prayer for anything specific, you need somebody to just stand with you in prayer and faith and believe with you for something, um, we'd love to pray with you today. But between now and then, what we're going to do is focus on the sacrifice of Jesus by which he fulfilled all the law and the prophets, by which he calls you to a very, very high standard that can only be reached when your life is filled with what filled his life. Our final course, if you will, today is to look at the table and the meal that Jesus prepared. This is an important Jewish meal. It was the meal of Passover that he shared with his disciples. I want you to see these elements that Jesus invited his disciples to the table. He said, I have longed to share this meal with you. And he invited them to come. And a table is a place of what? Relationship, connection, right? God help you if you sit at the dinner table with phones out, right? Because it's a place to have face-to-face -face interaction with another human being. A table that was in a large, fully furnished upper room, Luke 22 says. I find that really, really important. It's actually the same room, scholars believe, that the disciples waited for the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, Acts 2, they were in this upper room when the Holy Spirit came and that wind blew through and there were tongues of fire and Peter you know, fell out into the streets and preached and 3,000 people got saved and the church was birthed from God's work, not man's work. But in this room, Jesus, Jesus says, go and you'll find a fully furnished upper room. What does that mean? Everything needed is already at the table. God provided it. It's provided for you to just show up and sit down. The disciples went and found it just as Jesus said. And they shared the Passover meal together. The Passover was celebrated to remember when God told Moses to have the Israelites put blood of a lamb on their doorpost to avoid the judgment coming to the Egyptians. It showed the Israelites that there was a righteousness not their own protecting them from judgment. Jesus is the lamb of God by his blood applied to your life, by faith in his finished work, you escape the judgment that you and I both deserve because we fall short of God's glory in our own effort. But Jesus perfectly fulfilled it. And we receive as God's gift grace, forgiveness, and blessing as a child of God. Jesus broke bread and gave it to them. Well, in John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And I've come down from heaven. You thought it was awesome when Moses, you know, spoke to God and manna came down from heaven. Well, here I am. I'm better than that bread. I'm better than this bread. He's the bread you were meant to receive 
and, and from who he is to go into not just your body like this cracker will in, in a few moments, but that who Jesus is would reside on the inside of you. Jesus gave them a cup of wine to share. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood. That's what the, the juice and the wine represent. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the, the riches of God's grace. Communion reminds us this morning and at all times that Jesus fulfills all the law and prophets. Jesus completes the story of God. Jesus invites you to the table for a relationship, and Jesus provides everything needed for this meal. Would you stand with me as we get ready to receive in these final closing moments? I want to ask everybody, just hold this in your hand for a second. Close your eyes. Scripture tells us very clearly this meal is for believers. And if you're here this morning and, and you're like, I'm not ready to believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus. I'm not sure about all this stuff. I would just ask you to set this meal aside because the Apostle Paul actually said you could be taking, taking judgment upon yourself by taking this meal inappropriately. But I want to give you an opportunity right now, if you want to receive this meal because you want to believe in Jesus as he's been presented to you this morning as the one who fulfills every requirement of God, as the one who provides everything needed for you to share this relationship and meal with God. Right now is your chance and your moment. If you're here in the room, and when you came in, you would have said, yeah, I don't believe in Jesus. But right now you're saying, I can't believe how good God is. I want to believe. Would you pray quietly and simply right now? Jesus, I believe. You are the Son of God. I might have a lot of questions that need working out later, but I know all my questions can be answered in you. I might not be an expert on all the law and prophets, but I believe the word I've heard today, that you are the law and prophets. And your finished work on the cross is all I need. I call you Savior, and I call you teacher today, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, everybody keep your eyes closed. Let's focus now on the elements. For all who believe in Jesus this morning, let's open up the bread first. Now, this is just a, a gluten-free cracker for us this morning. But by the Spirit of God, we understand that we are invited to receive the broken body of Jesus as revealed on the cross, having been beaten and, and tortured and nails driven through his hands and feet. He gave his life and he gave his body as a sacrifice for us. Pray with me. Jesus it's just your righteousness that makes me right with God. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. I could never begin to even start this process, certainly not come to the Father apart from you. But today I receive this as your body and the only way that I can come to the Father. Let's receive together. Flip it over and be very careful with the juice. Representing the blood of Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, you invited your disciples in that first meal, and you invite us today to receive from this cup, representing a new covenant, representing a new way of being human. Today, God, we're drinking this cup, having trusted in you for salvation, for righteousness, for every requirement. Help us be holy as you are holy by your blood and only by your blood, Jesus. Let's receive it together. I'm going to invite the altar prayer team to come as we close in prayer. Any of our volunteers with these blue lanyards can pray over you, stand with you for anything you need today. Let's pray. Close our service out. Thank you, Jesus, for every way that you are proving the Father's love to us today. Thank you that you have fully provided everything we need for this meal and for our relationship with you. And I pray especially for any friends in the room who maybe began to believe in you for the first time today that you would continue to provide everything they need to receive from you and be filled with what filled your life. We love you, we honor you, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather like this today. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said, 
Amen.